Cool. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Neo4j online meetups. This is number 30 for those of you who are keeping count. And we've got three guests with us uh, today. So we're going to be talking about uh, Spring Data Neo4j 5 and uh, OGM 3 release, which was a few weeks ago. So for those of you who are new to watching stuff on, on uh, YouTube Live, uh, it, there might be code in this talk. So you'll want to make sure your resolution is high enough so that you can read it uh, in the bottom right hand corner of your YouTube um, window there's a there's a little button which says hd on it set that to 720p or higher uh, only other thing is if you've got any questions you can either ask them on the youtube chat on the right hand side of the video or you can ask them uh, on the slack channel nifj hyphen online hyphen meetup so we are watching both of those uh, well, well certainly i'm watching the youtube chat one and i'll pass on the questions and, and the others are watching uh, the slack uh, so I guess with that, I will we'll, we'll let, let our guests introduce themselves. So I guess we'll start with uh, Frantisex, and maybe we can just do a quick, quick introduction to yourself, what you do, and how you got into Neo4j, and maybe how you got into uh, SDN. OK, so uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Frantisex Harkman. I am a longtime SDN user and Neo4j user. I started using SDN with the version 2.2, and it was Neo4j 1.9 at the time. Uh, the, the first uh, um, meeting with Neo4j was a, like a quick POC of some medicine uh, content management. Uh, recently, I've joined Graphaware to work on OGM and SDN specifically, and I've been involved a lot in the latest release. So I'm happy to talk to you guys about this. Cool. All right, Garrett. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Garrett from Germany. I'm working at Neo since September now. I have not this background like uh, Frontiersteck has with Neo4j, but I started to develop applications since the, I think, the great 2.5 versions. And so I got into Neo4j. I'm now the, the team lead in Neo4j for SDN and OGM. I'm very happy to work with some experienced guys like Nicolas and Frantisek. So, yeah. Cool. Great. Welcome, Gary, as well. And I guess finally, Nicolas. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mark, for inviting us at this meetup. Uh, so, I'm Nicolas Merveille. Uh, I'm based in France. Um, I work as a senior consultant for GraphAware and uh, I'm a core developer on SDN. Um, I've been working for many years in uh, large companies as a technical coach, and that's how I discovered the, the Spring Framework and Neo4j, and I, I work with them on some many projects. Um, if you allow me to do a bit of self-promotion, I'm also uh, a co-author with uh, Sylvain Roussy and uh, Nicolas Rouillet of a French book about Neo4j, uh, which is to be published very soon, uh, by the end of the month, uh, called uh, Neo4j Tome de Déploiement. So if you speak French, uh, you can check it out. Cool. All right. So so, you're, so I'm going to hand over the presenting power to you. And I guess we can get underway with the, the talk. So you should have control yeah. now. Cool. Yeah, I can see it. I guess we're ready to go. OK. So. Um, What's our agenda for today? Um, we'll talk about uh, what is, uh, of course, uh, Spring Data and Spring Data Neo4j, its history, and um, <clears throat> how it works uh, by examples. Um, and we'll talk a bit more specifically about its use in enterprise applications. And finally, we'll also share some news and talk about the future of SDN. Um, what you can expect from this little hour uh, together is an understanding of the architecture of uh, Spring Data Neo4j and uh, the object graph mapper and how it can be integrated in your applications. Um, also, you will know what are the benefits you can gain from using it in your applications. And um, if you are already an SDN user in your projects, uh, then uh, we'll talk about the new features of SDN 5. So we already presented ourselves. 
let's do a little big history uh, just before we start. Um, it, SDN all started uh, in 2010, where these two guys, uh, Emil uh, Ifrem and Rod Johnson, uh, met uh, at a conference and started talking about uh, developing uh, data access to databases uh, with the Spring framework. And they decided to hack and start on something together, which would become uh, the Spring Data framework. And actually, Spring Data Neo4j module uh, was the first module and what the foundation for this framework. And so about Spring Data Neo4j, more specifically, is now in version 5 uh, that we released a few weeks ago. And there are many people uh, working on it uh, from Neo4j, GraphAware, and Pivotal. So let's start with Spring Data. Um, Spring Data is the basis uh, for Spring Data Neo4j. It's an open source project based on the on the Spring, which is part of the Spring ecosystem, and it offers a consistent uh, programming model, uh, much like what exists in the the Spring the other Spring projects for data access. So as you can see, this is an umbrella project which uh, which offers uh, uh, different modules. Um, to, to access specific databases, like, for example, Neo4j, Redis, or relational databases uh, like Postgres. And it's quite used. Uh, as you can see, the, the latest stats, we have about 1 uh, million downloads per month, uh, all projects uh, together. So. Spring Data Neo4j uh, is, the, is the, the dedicated Neo4j sub-project on that. And it's a framework that has two objectives. Uh, first is to standardize how applications are written. Um, because when you work on large projects, there are many people. And when you're developing such a project, you probably want to have some common patterns and uh, not everyone doing his stuff. Uh, so, so you have common, need, you need common ways to doing things, and this is really important because uh, if you want to to have code that is easy and to read and to maintain, and if you want to to get new developers uh, joining the project uh, up and running uh, uh, quickly, then this is uh, really important to to have a, a consistent style. Um, <clears throat> So the, the, the difference, it, it, this is a sub-project of the Spring Data family. And the difference between the other projects is that it optimizes uh, all the data access uh, for Neo4j. For example, it makes it easy to load uh, object graphs into memory from the database. Um, so so it, it really adapts the common patterns that exist in the base framework and, 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 and enhances them um to to make the applications you're writing more fluent uh, with neo4j so what's inside um what we see when we develop an application is um is a spring data neo4j of course but it's only part of the whole stack um, most of the actual work is uh, actually carried on by the underlying object graph mapper or ogm um, when I mean most of it, it's about 90%. Um, we won't go into the details here, but uh, in OGM, we find things like the database connection management, uh, the driver's ab abstraction layer, which allows you to, to develop the same way whatever API you use uh, to, to, to discuss with Neo4j. And um, most importantly, uh, this is the, the place where <coughs> Uh, where happens all the mapping back and forth between your object domain model and the database. Uh, so yeah, SDN is really built on top of OGM and also great features and provides good integration with the Spring ecosystem. Uh, all that means that if you're not a Spring shop, then you can still use the OGM without Spring and uh, get most of the benefits of it. Um, this kind of architecture uh, also exists in other Spring Data projects. For example, if you use relational databases, you have Spring Data 
JPA, which is built on which is built on top of uh, JPA implementations like Hibernate. So I now let speak. Gerrit will talk about a bit more about SDN in action. Yeah. Um, I just want to present, well, introduce Spring Boot at this point, because if you're interested in Spring Data on Neo4j, um, this is a good place to start. Um, for those who don't know Spring Boot, I give a short introduction, um, because Spring Boot is really nice to set up new projects, um, prototypes fastly, but Spring Boot is not at all a prototyping framework used as a foundation in huge enterprise applications by now provides such a nice features like the actuator um, we mentioned here is a ability to monitor your systems in production mode or you can see stats like health um, metrics even your current yeah your current uh, memory consumption which is really nice if you work with a lot of data. Um, but that's not all. Um, you can say that. This is stuff I can integrate in every project I have. It does also a dependency version management for you. That means if you um, use um, specific dependencies, um, Spring Boot provides you the right version. It does it in the Maven world with a parent POM definition, and it tries to keep the um, versions of your dependencies on the level where they play well together. That's, that's one reason why um, we do not support um, the new released um, SDN 5 in Spring Data and uh, Spring Boot um, 1.5. You have to go to upgrade your um, Spring Boot application to the latest milestone, like I point out there want to uh, benefit from the latest features we uh, develop. So if you want to play with Spring Data on Neo4j, it's a good point to start um, at the start of Spring I.O., select the latest milestone for, from Spring Boot, and add Neo4j to your dependency. If you can generate your project then, Nicholas, Nicholas my, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you get a um, Spring, Booter, a Spring Boot starter um, in your project that gives you the possibilities to set up your database connection um, in the application properties for those who know that. Um, this is one of the main configuration files you get out of the box with Spring, uh, with Spring Boot. And you also get this nice um, versioning support so you can if you now pull the latest um, Spring Data Neo4j version in your project, that might be 5.0.1 at this point, um, with the latest OGM version um, that's compatible with it, so that's 3.0.1. But if we do if we do some um, service release for OGM, you can still upgrade this OGM version by setting the OGM version property in your project because we, are, we will uh, um, API, uh, our API is stable, so to the latest AGM version in there. Yeah, and to get started um, with the rest of the configuration, you just have to enable the Neo4j repositories so that um, Spring Data Neo4j just um, looks into these packages for repository interfaces we provide. Um, that's all for now. So, yeah, you can also configure your Spring application without Spring Boot. You'll need. You just specify some beans that wording, um, more wording setup, but it in the end it's the same like we provided in the this this application properties before. Are not bounded to use it with Spring Boot. Now we get to the one of the um, the main uh, the central pieces of Spring Data projects, the repositories. If you create um, a, a repository interface, 
we do not uh, talk about class implementation. So it's something like that. We just create interfaces for that. Thing is a predefined repository you have in Spring Data. Out of the box support for all the quad operations, and avoid the boilerplate Nicola mentioned. By that, you do not have to care about implementing a match um, cipher, safe cipher, or delete ciphers. And with uh, Spring Data Neo4j, you also get a speci uh, specialized version of the repositories. And it brings to the optional parameter um, dev um, that will uh, that allows you to modify your saving or loading dev. I think Fantisec will talk about this later. So um, the second the second um, main feature of Swing. Oh, sorry, um, Nicola, can you? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> The second uh, main feature of Spring Data in general and all the Spring Data projects are the derived queries. Um, as you can see, it's this little sample here. Do have a um, repository for um, you can generate, uh, you can define such methods like find by name, like, and age between. I need parameters here. So we will. Um, or every Spring Data project and also Spring Data Neo4j will take care about um, creating the right. So the resulting cipher might look something like the cipher I, I wrote underneath there. You do not have to, um, you do not have to care about writing your own uh, query statements to try to give you the. Um, the, the, the advantage of um, focusing on your business models and business um, business code. A complete repository will look like this. Um, as I mentioned before, we specify this for this user entity. We'll see later. And the first method is something we saw before: derive query sample. But this, if it's not enough to have this. Um, out of the box derive query features. You can also um, specify your own queries, providing this query annotation. So this is not the, the, the rocket science part of Cypher, but it's just the idea. Can um, this is placeholder at the age property there, and if you call this method, you have to provide this age and get injected into this. Parameter there, and it's counting up or more parameters if you need them. And yeah, it will um, work as a, it will then inject the parameter and uh, fire the cipher query. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, since, since we're talking now about the whole entities and the user entity, let's have a look at this user entity, how we will. Would like to see it <laughs> if you um, annotate it. This uh, things are we're pointing out also in the documentation. So I do not want to talk about the um, specific um, usage of this uh, of these annotations, but uh, point out that we really want you to um, use this um, annotations to be uh, safe for your own, like the node entity annotation. Um, I think in the next slide we will see that you can also provide your own labels um, on this. Yeah, and if Nicola might get back once again, um, and the property annotations, because um, if you're starting to refactor your classes or your properties in your classes, and you do not provide this um, this names or labels for your classes or properties, you might get um, get no access anymore to them store data in the Neo4j, and then refactoring your model, and it's get derived from the uh, property names of your classes, um, it might be a one way. Um, and another point is, yeah, you might skip the ID and generated value. Fantasec will uh, speak later about at the ID uh, property, and it will work out of the box. It will type as long for 
toxicity, it should be there. So we will uh, re recommend to use all the properties if you're defining your node entities. So we might just skip to the next slide. And I think I told about the label you can provide in there, but um, I just want to point out if you're using class hierarchies, um, Neo, uh, Spring Data Neo4j will look into your whole hierarchy to um, derive every label that's needed for your nodes in the end. Because if you have the sample like the actor uh, who was derived, uh, who was extending in a person in the Java world, um, you also get the two labels generated on your nodes in the Neo in Neo4j. Um, so you do not have to care about this to um, to my uh, to have the possibility to find all persons in your database at the end. So next one, because I just started to talk about labels for classes. Um, we saw the samples about labeling the classes by defining the the property entity annotation, and if it's not given, it's get derived from the class name. Possibility to to add or remove labels at one time. Just yeah, it's as simple as it stands there. Um, just the label annotation, um, that gets put on some set field type field and you can work with these labels um, uh, restrictions you have to care about um, um, or must not um, use the same labels like your class names or the names you defined in the node entity annotation by clash and you should not a bunch of labels on your same classes because if we save entities in SDN we try to save them um, in the bulk with labels or the types then so if you have a uh, multiple sets that are, do not match ever do not have the same labels um, inform, uh, not so great import not so great performance then so there's just some things you have to keep in mind so yeah, and now we're coming to also dynamic stuff. And the next slide, yeah. This uh, new feature of Spring Data Neo4j, it's called um, dynamic properties. Fields on your nodes um, in the database that you do not want to explicitly map your the Java world, you can use this um, pop dynamic properties to read from them. So all properties that match the um, the types you give in the it's a second uh, type parameter to the map uh, will get put into this map object here. We get everything we have not mapped before. But if you just take the integers there, or we take a map of string and uh, integer, we just get the um, the types from the Neo4j database that can be mapped to an integer type. So yeah, so this this type based feature might not be suiting enough. So your prefix, like the sample shows you here, um, to use um, something like sample additional info where you put all these strings you know um, into the um, into the um, property set so yeah that's all for me so I give the word to Fantasec. thank you uh, another feature in SDN find that has been uh, not it's not new feature but it's been reworked is the ID management we used to have the uh, add graph ID annotation, and we still have it uh, for the backwards compatibility. So if you upgrade, you don't need to change anything in terms of your ID management, but there is uh, there is a lot of new stuff for you to uh, to work with. So uh, every 
entity, every domain entity in your in your domain must have ID field, some kind of an ID field de defined, and there must be exactly one uh, ID field per class hierarchy. This means that if you have a, for example, base entity person, and then you have entities like employee and manager, uh, you need to put the ID either in the uh, person uh, class or into the subclasses. So in this case, it would make sense to put the ID into person class. Uh, so once you define the ID field, there are several ways how to assign the ID. Uh, the easiest or, or the simplest way is to base to assign this ID manually. Uh, this might be useful when the ID already exists in some kind of a, a legacy system, or you just want to simply generate it in your Java code. Um, and if you want to uh, leave the generation to the framework, there are two pro options provided. Uh, the first one is internal ID strategy. Uh, this basically leaves the generation of the ID to the database and uses the node and the relationship IDs as the ID uh, of the entity. Uh, in this case, the type of the ID must be long and uh, combining the ID uh, annotation and generated value with the default internal ID strategy is equivalent to previously known graph ID. Uh, the, the other provided generation strategy is UID strategy, and it uh, simply generates uh, a random UID for your entity, and the type of the uh, of the property in this case would be either UID class or string class. And for cases where this is not suitable for you, we have a pluggable, pluggable, uh, pluggable way to, to provide your own generation strategy. And uh, if your generator is simple, you just provide a class name in the generated value strategy parameter, or you can register an instance of the generation strategy with the session factory. And you would use this typically in a scenario where you need access to third party system or some you want to call some other dependencies and you want to create an instance of the generator by yourself and not uh, let the framework instantiate the, the generator. And closely related to the IDs is the index and constraint management. So first of all, uh, how to enable the creation of uh, indexes and constraints. Uh, you can, you should use the indexes.auto property. Uh, there are several possible values uh, for details, see the auto index mode Java doc, but just briefly, uh, the none does uh, nothing and it's the default value. Uh, assert simply drops all existing indexes and recreates new indexes from based on the domain classes. Validate checks all the indexes defined in the domain classes against existing indexes in the database and dump writes the cipher queries to a file so you could use it later to generate or to create the indexes in Neo4j. And uh, how are the indexes actually defined? So there is one default constraint for the uh, ID field. And this is in cases where the ID is on a uh, on a property, and it's not the internal ID uh, of the of the node. Uh, you can create additional constraints by providing the index with unique parameter set to true, and you can create uh, additional indexes by providing providing just the index annotation on any field in in your domain classes. Uh, for those who not, don't know, the difference between the index and constraint is that constraint requires uniqueness among the among the values. We've got a quick question for you from the chat, so it's from yeah. Jonathan. Which it, the question is: in uh, when, in which moment does the indexing process occur? So I guess yeah, when when does that fire off if you set an index somewhere? When does uh, the index get created? At the startup of the application, so it's uh, when you create the session factory. So when you create the session factory, you need to provide the domain packages, 
and it scans the domain packages. And after it does all the scanning, it is able to work out this, uh, like what indexes it should create. So it's just after scanning all the packages. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So this is uh, very useful in development and uh, possibly on a on a simple uh, applications in production as well. But we really recommend uh, either thorough testing or uh, handling the, uh, for example, dumping the, the cipher queries uh, for the indexes to a file and then running running the uh, index creation at a uh, at a point in time where you are really sure that you are able to do this because the index creation might uh, put some load on the database uh, or. Uh, or some other thing might happen. It's very similar to, for example, Hibernate uh, option to to create the uh, the indexes and and the, the schema definitions, and uh, either don't use it in a production or test very thoroughly. Okay, so when when we are saving data into Neo4j, we need to convert the uh, the the data we have in our uh, in our classes into types uh, supported by Neo4j and OGM and as, hence SDN uh, supports has some built-in uh, support for type conversion. We support the primitive and boxed types, uh, arrays and collections of these primitives uh, or of these box types, strings, enums which get converted to strings, and date. Uh, and including local date and other uh, Java 8 uh, date types, uh, which by default get converted to uh, the ISO 8601 uh, date format, but you can choose the date format by yourself, or you could store uh, the dates as uh, just simple uh, timestamps as well. Uh, so you should be aware of some limitations of uh, the of the individual drivers. For example, for the HTTP driver, when we send the data to Neo4j uh, over HTTP and REST, we need to convert all the data into JSON. And in JSON, we can't disting really distinguish between, for example, long and big decimal. So it's uh, you should you should check whether how the how the data looks like in your database and whether. It makes a issue for you, or for example, in the bold driver, uh, bold only supports one integer type and doesn't differentiate between Java's uh, integer and long. So when we when you have a integer in your class and send the data over bold driver, it will end up as long in the database. And then when later you read it back, uh, OGM converts this into back into integer because that's what you have in your domain class. But in the database, it is stored as long. And uh, you should be aware of this, especially when you manipulate the data in custom Cypher queries. Uh, otherwise, it usually doesn't cause any, any issues. And when the built-in conversion doesn't fit your needs, we provide a way to convert, the, uh, convert your objects or uh, some value objects into properties. So if you have a just one-to-one -one mapping, so you have some instance and you want to convert it into one property, there is the attribute converter uh, that you need to implement and provide the convert annotation with the converter class name. And this will be used when the, uh, when the property is uh, either stored to the database or read to the database. Uh, you should uh, also handle the null values in in these converters so for example if the uh, property if, if the field value is null or if the property in the database is null you should either uh, propagate a null value or you could create some kind of a default value uh, this is really up to up to you and for cases where uh, your value object would translate into multiple properties uh, so in this case, we have a location which would have a longitude and latitude fields. Uh, so it's like two double fields. And you, you want to translate this into two, uh, two properties uh, instead of just one property. So we are able to query it later, for example, in Cypher. Uh, you would use the composite attribute converter. And this one takes the actual value of, of your field 
and you need to return a map of uh, of a string to some some objects, and the string is going to be na the name of the property, and the objects the the values are the values in the, in, in those properties. Uh, again, uh, you need to provide uh, you need to be able to handle the null values and missing values, missing properties, and also be aware that we don't check any uh, any clashes between the the property names that you return in this map and names of other properties in your classes. So if you return the same, it's uh, it's up to you to uh, to basically handle this. Basically, you shouldn't do it. And when when your data is not to be stored as uh, properties, but as relationships between uh, objects, uh, we have basically two options how to store relationships. Uh, first one is the simpler relationship. And this is a case where one node entity refers directly to another node entity. So in this case, both person and movie are node entities. Or and there is a there might be a collection of node entities or just a single instance of of movie or array of movies or set of movies. It it, it really doesn't matter. It, it just affects whether it's a one to one or one to n uh, mapping. So you can either de uh, just define the field or you should you you could provide you can provide the relationship annotation and we advise actually to provide those to be more specific. Uh, because for the type, the default type is taken from the field, uh, but in Neo4j, the convention is to have a uh, capitalized uh, name of the relationships, and the default direction is outgoing. Uh, you can change this into either incoming, which uh, both correspond to either incoming or outgoing relationship in Neo4j, and the other possible value for the direction of the relationship is undirected, which basically means that you don't care about the uh, direction, and it's going to be either, in Neo4j, it's going to be either incoming or uh, outgoing, uh, depending, uh, it's not defined how it's going to end up in the database, and when we read, we also don't care about the direction in, in the, such case. Uh, so you can, uh, can you go back, Nicholas, please? Uh, so you can define this relationship uh, either only on one side or, or on both sides. So you could define uh, the link from the movie back to person with the type of the relationship and the other direction. Uh, but you don't have to. It's up to you, and this is actually used in the uh, in the schema uh, based loader. And and uh, if you want to make some performance optimization, you can leave out some uh, some fields, uh, which which will in turn uh, result in less data being loaded from the database. So, for example, if you if you don't de declare the person in the in the movie class. Uh, it's not going to get loaded. So this is uh, this is up to you how to how you model the data and your domain. So the second way how to uh, def declare a relationship is a rich relationship. Uh, in this case, the the field doesn't refer to another node entity, but it refers to relationship entity. Uh, it still has the relationship annotation. And the relationship entity looks like um, like a simple class with relationship entity annotation, and has a has a type. The type should correspond to the type defined on the relationship uh, annotation in the in the node, and the direction uh, implied by the start node and end node should match uh, the direction defined in the relationship uh, annotation in the node entity. So the relationship entity has three compulsory fields, is the ID, uh, start node, and end node. And then it has multiple, uh, it, can has, it can have any, uh, any other properties, so arbitrary number of properties. The difference between rich relationship and uh, a simpler relationship is that this one can have the properties, uh, the simpler relationship doesn't, and the other difference is 
that there can be multiple instances between the same node uh, of of same two nodes of one type. So in this in this case, on the on the example on the right, we have a, a person Tom Hanks who acted in a Cloud Atlas Atlas movie, uh, but he actually had multiple roles in there. And you can either you could either store the roles uh, as as a property of the single relationship, or if for some reason you want to model it as multiple relationships, uh, you should use rich relationships uh, to to achieve this in OGM. I've got a question for you about relationships. So the question is: Is there a compile error if the start node and end node does not correspond? Got to correspond with the relationship mapping, or when is it checked? Um, so when the start node and end node doesn't correspond to the relationship, relationship mapping. Yes. Uh, so I'm actually not sure whether this is uh, this is checked at the at the startup time. Um, yeah, okay, the, we can, we can so, so if the, yeah, so if the if it doesn't match, the behavior is basically undefined. We don't have any defined behavior. Like sometimes we probably throw an exception, but we actually might have a case where we don't. For example, when you have a start node which is person, and then in the node entity uh, there is either a subclass or a superclass of person, and we don't have all these cases defined, it would be uh, really complicated to to like list all the cases and say what happens in those situations. Okay, cool. So, so you should really match those, and it's kind of your job to to as a developer to to do so. Okay, okay so I think it's back to Nicholas. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, let me talk a bit about enterprise applications and SDN in enterprise applications. Um, we, we talked about um, before having a consistent development style and uh, large applica applications with many developers. And this is really a value that Spring brings. Um, but when you're building an enterprise application, you may also have a good resource handling, uh, like connection management. Uh, uh, also, data consistency with ACID transactions, uh, good availability uh, by using clusters, and you probably expect also good performance out of the box. And of course, uh, when talking enterprise, you have to integrate to other systems. So let's talk about transactions. Um, in this spring style way of doing things uh, in SDM, you have declarative transaction management, uh, which means that you don't code anything, but you uh, declare on your classes or you know, on your methods. Uh, these are transactional annotations you can see here. And this triggers all the low level details for you. you know, so the, the framework handles all that. Uh, this is uh, really cool because it's less code and um, more, more, much more reliable than you can do by yourself. Um, something also uh, interesting in terms of large applications, and especially uh, uh, with a lot of data when you have clusters, is that this uh, transaction management is uh, cluster friendly. You can just specify to the transaction annotation that you're operating, you're operating read only. And if it's the case, the driver automatically will route the requests to the replica servers, uh, so the new 4 j replica servers. Um, and then this will lead to, to an offload of, um, of the core servers and an overall better performance. So this is really a cool thing when you use a, a causal cluster. Um, talking, talking about causal consistency, that you may know that when you use this kind of cluster uh, to benefit from causal consistency, you have to use bookmarks. So, um, in, and in, in some situation, situations, uh, SDN helps you by handling the book bookmarks automatically. Uh, there's uh, this declarative bookmark management approach, which is much more much like the, the transaction approach uh, by using annotations. 
you basically tell uh, SDN to, when you save something, grab the bookmark that is coming back from the database and store it somewhere, like in, an, in a context. And then when you, you operate read-only, the, the bookmark can be automatically uh, passed to the database and without you uh, having to do anything. So it's, it's really interesting. About performance, um, yeah, you you all already know that uh, Neo4j is really great at working with relations, um, and uh, thanks to index three adjacent adjacency, it's very cheap to get connected data. Um, it, in in the real world, when you work on data, it probably doesn't work like this. You just don't work on a single uh, node alone. It's probably much more like that, or even more in a realistic, a realistic way like this. And it's really easy to do that with SDN. And it's cheap because, uh, well, the database handles uh, it very well. And we talked about depth earlier. And this is really something that helps when uh, grabbing a lot of uh, data. Uh, you can pass this uh, variable load depth when you want to load something to define the 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 really the levels how many levels you want to to load but that can cause some performance problem for example if your application only uses a subset of the data present in the database um, imagine that you have a very rich and connected database but your application only wants to expose a specific business view of it, um, you probably don't want to load everything. Uh, because if you will load everything, it can be slow. And that's what, in SDN, we have uh, the, the new schema-based loading, starting from SDN 5, um, which looks at your object model. And by using annotations and uh, the, what you define in your code is able to adapt the queries that uh, are being run uh, uh, and adapt the request according. We did some benchmarks on that. So it's not really a, really representative benchmarks, but it gives an idea of the improvements of that. Uh, on the movie data set, we compared the average movie load time between SDN 4.2 in clear blue uh, in SDN 5 in dark blue and using handwritten queries. So here, what we can see is, uh, yeah, that there, there is a, a lot of improvement uh, between version four and five. And in this uh, scenario, you get uh, a lot of performance benefits um, by, by using schema-based loading. Um, something interesting also is the, the change uh, object change tracking that exists in SDM. When you load something and you modify it, you probably don't modify everything. So when you pass all your objects back to OGM, uh, there is a, a tracking, a change detection that takes place and just uh, updates and sends to the database what really needs to be. And this optimizes uh, lots of things and sends much less uh, data over the wire. Of course, when we write also enterprise applications, uh, we have to integrate with the outside. Uh, for example, for, by providing an API on top of your data and uh, doing some, some REST APIs. So there is uh, this project called Spring Data REST that exists in the, the Spring ecosystem uh, that gives you the ability to really easily expose repositories as REST resources. Um, and not only your data, but also the metadata. So the schema of your um, domain object model, uh, either as a JSON schema or ALPS. And you can customize all that. And it also provides you a discover discoverable API with navigation links, links between entities, uh, which is, well, make, that makes sense when you use a, a graph database. Uh, great, but uh, is uh, is it a silver bullet, SDN? Not, of course not. Uh, there are some scenarios when you don't want to use it. For example, when you are doing some bulk import or export, um, 
you, you manipulate a lot of data, you want to um, <clears throat> optimize for IO. And the, 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 the tools provided with uh, Neo4j or uh, ETLs like uh, DataBridge can, will be probably much more performant uh, than um, going through an additional layer like OGM. Another use case is when you have uh, a mismatch between your graph database model and your domain object model. If you try to um, make them talk together, uh, if they really don't match with SDN, you will have some hard time at um, doing some efficient applications. And the third case, if, if you use complex cipher queries, I mean, there's no sense of uh, maybe using SDN with provide, which provides you with some basic CRUD access. Um, if you're always going to do some cipher, complex cipher, just go with plain uh, driver usage. And then Frantisek will talk about the new features in SDN 5. OK. so. SDN 5, we have talked about some of the new features. Uh, so let's first talk about some uh, limitations or dependencies. So uh, SDN 5 is to be used with uh, Spring Framework 5 and Spring Boot 2 and Java 8 and newer. And there's also a dependency on uh, Neo4j 3.1 or newer because we used the uh, list compression comprehensions in uh, the schema-based loader. So other main features that we have added in 5 is the better, better causal cluster support. Uh, so one thing is being able to provide multiple core servers at the, at the startup. So uh, you can now do that. And then the other part is the bookmark management. Uh, so uh, Nicolas talked about that. So you basically provide a, uh, instance of bookmark manager, which stores the bookmarks when any transaction ends. And then when you want to use the bookmark, you just use the annotation and uh, the transaction manager will look into the bookmark manager for uh, the latest bookmarks. And by scoping the bookmark manager, you you affect whether the uh, whether you use bookmark of your own thread or maybe other users or just one instance. And this is completely configurable and uh, ready for you to use. So another feature is the schema-based loading. It basically takes uh, the schema defined by the, the mapping metadata in the domains. Uh, in the domain classes. Uh, so this is the labels on node entities and relationship types and generates a query. Uh, and this query is basically a list comprehension of, uh, of um, uh, uh, multiple list comprehensions per, per the relationships. And this it generates very efficient query to load only the data that you want. And it avoids loading data that you either have in the graph and don't use in your application, or it avoids loading data in other direction that you, then you have defined. And this brings a large performance improvement. And we would like everyone to, to try this on, to, to test it. You can sw still switch back to the old way of loading data, but uh, we have set this new schema based as the default. We really want you to use it. And uh, we want to continue also on improving it. So we probably will look into how to do the same for fields. So we avoid loading all fields from the database. So if there is a like a large field on a node that you don't use or you don't define in your domain, we want to avoid loading that as well. But that's the future. Another thing to look out for is that we have switched to field access only. So now when we set the values of the properties and relationships, we go directly to the field. We don't use setters anymore. The main reason is that we avoid the confusion about needing to provide the relationship annotation on both the field and setter in certain cases. And hopefully, this will, re uh, this will result into less questions about, about this. Uh, the new feature dynamic properties is basically, uh, Garrett talked about this, and this basically is aimed at allowing you to use uh, Neo4j as a schemaless database. So you don't have to define uh, and 
you don't have to define schema in Neo 4J, but by defining your classes, you basically define some kind of a schema, and this allows you to kind of run away from any any kind of schema. So it might be suitable for some kind of a, a very dynamic uh, applications or uh, other use cases. Uh, I've talked about the new ID management, and uh, there is a new feature called projections in uh, uh, Spring Data Neo 4J. This allows you to create a simple interface, which is a which is usually a subset of uh, some uh, some entity or a subset. It, it the interface contains subset of properties of some entity, and it, uh, it can be used as a return value from repositories. And you basically define only the interface, and then Spring Data Neo 4 J uh, takes care of uh, backing the interface by the instance of the entity. And this helps you to reduce the number of DTOs that you need to write, or uh, or it can lead to better and more maintainable code by like providing a nicer interface uh, in the in the repositories. And what's next? We plan to reintroduce the named queries for you to be able to decide. So if you have some larger uh, cipher queries and want to have them somewhere separate from the repositories, you will be able to do that. We are working on auditing and versioning. So this is one of the most important features we have on the list at the moment. The Neo4j driver team is for working on asynchronous driver for Neo4j. Uh, so once that work uh, is done, we will be able to provide some reactive interface. So namely, it's the reactive repositories uh, in Spring Data, which are provided for some other databases, but not yet for uh, SDN. We want to improve the, the interoperability with Kotlin and some other JVM languages and provide full su support for Java 9. At the moment, we provide the, uh, we are able to, to run on Java 9 with the uh, automatic modules, but we want to provide full Java 9 support for this. And this, this is something that you should be able to contribute to. So if there are features that you're missing, uh, please open uh, issues on GitHub, ask questions on Sego Flow or prefer preferably the Slack channel or uh, to right into the chat. And if you have time, please take this short survey. It will tell us how you use uh, SDN and OGM. And it will give us a picture of uh, what our user base is like. Uh, there are many resources about SDN and OGM. I would like to po point out the issue templates. This is something that we have created for uh, for you to be able to better report bugs and uh, maybe feature requests. So uh, this basically create, allows you to easily create a sample project with a particular version of SDN and OGM and reproduce the, the bug on a very simple uh, domain that you put into the sample project. And uh, it's, it's a, like a separate uh, test case, it, it will give us a, a test case that we can uh, verify and then work with. So if you want to have, if you have a bug and you want to have it fixed, uh, providing the issue uh, template or the using the issue template is probably the fastest uh, way to, to get it fixed. And also follow the news on SDN, on Neo4j blog, and also on Grapher blog. And I guess thank you very much for attending this um, this online meetup. Uh, we will answer the questions that uh, come up on on the chat and on the Slack channel. So if you have any, please write them. Yeah, cool. So thanks to all of you pre for for presenting that. For anybody watching, and if you liked the the talk, don't forget to to like it on the YouTube uh, interface so that other people can find it as well. We have one question that we so Garrett Garrett's been answering some questions already on the on the chat, but I guess we can we can. We can ask it on here so that everybody can is not able to see it on there. I uh, can hear the answer as well. So there was one about the loading strategy that I think it was like six or seven slides ago. And the question is, can is that a OGM feature that, uh, or a SDN uh, feature? Could you just do that with OGM on its own? Uh, it's a OGM feature, so it's in both. Cool. 
And then next question is SDN in general, not specifically SDN5. Uh, is it possible to prevent concurrent writes by acquiring a write lock on a particular node? Is the question. Uh, right. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen this today on on the uh, SDN chat. So. Um, Uh, yes, in certain case, and uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a rather complicated, and I will probably leave this to the to the chat to the uh, yeah. SDN chat on Slack. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll answer there. Sense. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so if you're interested in that, then check the uh, so it's neofj.com forward slash Slack if you're not already a member on there, and you can join the SDN channel and uh, and read the conversation. Cool. I think I don't think we have any more uh, any more questions, but uh, if you have any uh, any questions. Uh, after this is broadcast, feel free to join the neo hyphen online hyphen meetup channel, and uh, we can answer them in there. Otherwise, thanks to Nicholas Garrett and Frenchek, uh, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.